La religion en langue de Nitsoro du Gabon, c'est profond. Ça dure depuis les ancêtres. Ils sont en train d'initier les enfants obligatoires. Et puis, leur esprit quitte le corps et aller au-delà pour voir ce qu'ils peuvent voir. Les gens du village, ils ne veulent pas que nous, les chrétiens, nous prions le vrai Dieu. Plus de 20 enfants, ils ont initié pour manger le, le bois sacré, dans leurs réunions, pour célébrer le, le, leur boutique. Dès 6 heures du matin, il dit, le fantôme, le fantôme de Mokinji est là. Et ils ont trouvé un petit bout de crâne comme ça. Il dit, le fantôme, c'est ça. Nous avons le brûlé. C'est ça, c'était le matin. On croyait que c'était déjà fini. 18 heures du soir. Ils ont crié encore. Ils ont venu, oh, oh, le, le fantôme de Mokinji là. Voilà le groupe des hommes. Dans le village, les initiés. Ils ont venu nous prendre ici. Il m'a fouté là, il m'a renvoyé à terre. Ils m'ont fait une série de... Moi, j'étais là, assis. Le dernier Mayanji était là. Mbembo était là. Ils ont amené le fil électrique pour, pour nous amarrer les pieds. Cela, ils ont allé chercher du pétrole. 5 bidons de pétrole. Ils ont venu le, nous les, les verser tout, tout le corps. Cela. Ils ont, ils ont venu avec le, le, le flambeau. Dites la vérité, que vous avez le fantôme. J'ai dit, ben, on va faire comment Il n'y a rien. Comme tu dis qu'il n'y a rien, ils ont, ils ont amené le, le, le flambeau pour nous brûler les, les, les pieds. Deux fois. Et la troisième fois, c'est là que j'ai crié. J'ai dit, oh mon Dieu, pardonne leur Pardonne mon peuple, ils ne savent pas ce qu'ils font. Les uns dans le village, ils, ils se plaignent dans le village. Les uns disent, non, laissez-les maintenant. Les douleurs de, de, du corps, de, du cœur. Oh, je voyais que la mort. Le dimanche, le 19, est arrivé à Albamba. C'est là qu'on a eu le premier soin. L'hôpital de Bongolo, il y a plus de mille, mille malades. Mais nous trois, on était les, les premiers. Docteur Son Thompson, avec son équipe, c'est merveilleux. Ça, c'est l'équipe des anges. Quand nous sommes venus de, de l'hôpital, après les deux mois, j'ai trouvé le, le noyau là, que vous avez trouvé en train de, de danser, en train de vous chanter là. C'est le Seigneur qui l'a voulu que je sois attaqué par l'ennemi. Je dois rester ferme jusqu'à la, la fin de ma vie. Nous prions pour ceux qui nous font du mal. Il faut être prêt à accueillir les persécutions. Il ne doit pas arrêter. Ce corps-là, c'est merveilleux, ce que Dieu a créé. Tous les habits étaient mouillés de, de pétrole. C'est Dieu qui, a, qui nous a protégés que nous ne voulons pas mes enfants ne doivent pas être brûlés tout entier. Et si je vis maintenant, c'est grâce à Dieu. C'est grâce à Dieu. Alléluia
We're going to be talking about this idea of how our, the issue of our words, revealing our hearts, what they reveal about us. And we're going to be continuing our series in Proverbs, but first I want to look at another story that I think illustrates this even better than the video. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to have it on the screen uh, today. I was in Ohio most of the week for different things, so I didn't have time to make a PowerPoint. We're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 25 to start. Now let me set the stage for you. When we're in 1 Samuel 25, 1 Samuel 24, for those of you that have grown up in the church, you may be familiar with the story. It is the story of when David snuck up behind Saul and cut off a corner of his garment. If you're not familiar, so Saul, the king, is pursuing David for really no reason other than the people like David. He's pursuing them. David and his men of fighters are running and hiding, and they go hide in this cave. And what happens? Well, Saul comes in to relieve himself. He comes in to, to go to the bathroom. And David sneaks up and cuts off a corner of his cloak. And after Saul leaves, he comes out and you know, says, hey, my king, why are, you, why are you chasing me? And Saul feels remorse and stops. Chapter 26, on the other side of this, David sneaks into Saul's camp. Once again, Saul is pursuing him. And he steals his water jug and his spear. And then goes outside of the camp and stands on a hill and calls out, Saul, why are you, why are you pursuing me? And so as we look at this story, we have to understand that, that David is not a man bent on destruction. He's not a man, a man bent on hurting someone. This is sandwiched between two instances where he could have taken the man who was trying to kill him. He could have taken his life, but he did not. 1 Samuel 25, 1 through 35. Some of this I'm going to read. Some of this I'll summarize for, for your sake. We're going to look at all the way 1 through 35. So now Samuel died, and all Israel assembled and mourned for him, and they buried him in his house at Ramah. And then David rose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. And there was a man in Moan whose business was in Carmel. The man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. He was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the, the name of the man was Nabal, and the, wife, and the name of his wife, Abigail. The woman was discerning and beautiful. But the man was harsh and badly behaved. He was a Calebite. David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep, so David sent ten young men, and David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel, go to Nabal, and greet him in my name, and thus you shall greet him. Peace to you, and peace to your house, and peace be to all you have. I hear that you have shears. Now your shepherds have been with us, and we did them no harm. They miss nothing all the time they are in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. Please give whatever you have had at hand to your servants, and your son David. So Nabal's men, they've been out with David's men, and David's men have not only not harassed them, not taken advantage of them, but they've provided some protection. And so in this day and age, in this culture, that was significant. They've looked out for his, for his flocks. And so this request David is making is saying, hey, you're having a feast? We have some food. It's not unreasonable. It's, it's actually a, a fairly nice request. And here comes David's response. When David's young men came, they said all this to Nabal in the name of David, and then they waited. And Nabal answered David's servants, Who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants these days who are breaking away from their masters. Shall I take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed from my shears and give it to men whom come from I do not know where? So David's young men turned away and came back and told him all this. And David said to his men, every man strap on his sword. And every man of them strapped on his sword. David also strapped on his sword. And while 400 men went up after David, while 200 remained with the baggage. And so it goes on, I'm going to summarize the next section. So basically Abigail finds out about this. And she knows who David is. David has a reputation. He's a, he's a fierce warrior with this band of very, very fierce men. And she just realized her husband just ticked off this dude. And smack kind of, you know, he came asking for something and he was basically smacking him in the face and said, get out of here. And so she prepares. She prepares 
How much? She, it says she made haste in, in verse 18 and took 200 loaves and two skins of wine and five sheep already prepared. And so she, she brings all this food, she gathers it up, and she goes out to meet him. Verse 23. When Abigail saw David, she hurried and got down from the donkey and befell before David on her face and bowed to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, On me alone, my Lord, be the guilt. Please let your servant speak to your ears and hear the words of your servant. Let not my Lord regard this worthless fellow. She's got a high opinion of her, of her husband. Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. But I, your servant, did not see this young man of my Lord whom you sent. Now then, my Lord, as the Lord lives, as your soul lives, because the Lord has restrained you from blood guilt and from saving with your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek to do evil to my Lord be his neighbor. And so she goes on, and she's basically making a request to intercede, and he's giving him these gifts. And in in verse 22, David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. Blessed be your discretion, and blessed be you who have kept me from this day, this day from blood guilt and from working salvation with my own hand. For surely as the Lord and God of Israel lives, who has restrained me from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come out to meet me, truly by morning there had not been left to Nabal so much as one male. Then David received from her hand what she had brought him, and he said to her, Go up in peace to your house. See, I have obeyed your voice, and I have granted your petition. As I said, today we're going to be back in Proverbs. The proverb we're looking at today is Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1, which tells us this. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. I think this story is a prime example. So we see this contrast, right? We see this contrast between the response of Nabal, who acted like an idiot and insulted David and his men. And what happened? It stirred up David's wrath. Then we see the response of Abigail, very humble, very gentle, came before him in meekness, and it calmed David's anger. Rash speech, most of us would admit, admit is rarely profitable. Now, I, I want to caveat this. There are times when we need to overcome any tendencies. Some of us have these tendencies to maybe stay quiet and not say anything when we should, uh, just to get along. But impulsive words of anger never, ever accomplish what we hope and usually bring with them regret. Chapter 15 goes on in several more verses to tell us about this. In verse 2, the tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouth of fools pours out folly. Verse 4, a gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Verse 18, a hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he is slow to anger, quiets contention. I dropped my notes. Verse 23, to make an apt answer is a joy to a man, and a word in season, how good is it? In verse 30, the light of the eyes rejoices the heart, and good news, good news refreshes the bones. I titled today's sermon, Water and Gasoline, Putting Out the Fires of Conflict. Now it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know. If you have a fire, I, know we, I come from the country, we had big bonfires. If we want to make them bigger, what did we throw on it? Well, we were idiots, we threw gasoline on it. If we want to put it out, what do we throw on it? Water, right? It's a pretty simple concept. Most of us know this. And most of us know this basic truth that conflict can be aggravated or calmed based on how you answer. A wise person knows how to get at the matters of the heart at hand. A wise person knows how to, to come to a solution that reasonably satisfies everyone but is still concerned with the truth. A fool, though, a fool thinks simply of himself. My interests, my rights, me. That throws gasoline on fire and prompts the other to do the same. 
Now, I said, a soft answer does not mean, mean we need to compromise the truth. If you turn over a couple pages to Proverbs 25.15, there's an interesting phrase there. Proverbs 25.15 tells us, With patience a ruler may be persuaded, and a soft tongue will break a bone. One can speak very softly and gently and still maintain great authority. I have a bad habit of not turning on my mic. Ron did a good job of reading Ephesians 4 for us earlier, which speaks of speaking the truth in love. I just want to highlight a couple of verses for the, from that. Ephesians 4. Verse 15 in Ephesians 4 said this, Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is ahead into Christ. We can speak the truth in love. Now the truth is, many of us here struggle to either speak love or speak the truth. We like to come across really powerful and, and, and harsh. Verse 25 says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. So we're still called to speak truth. We are not to skirt the truth. Speaking a soft answer is not shying away from the truth, but it's a matter of how we speak the truth and sometimes when we speak the truth. Let me share an example from a fellow pastor. Uh, one of the guys that's in our district, I, I won't tell you his name, but he shared this story at Difference Conference and I got a little in, in more in depth from him. He was talking about that in his career, he's kind of ended up being kind of a turnaround pastor. Now, if you don't know what that means, that means if a church is having a hard time of it, maybe the last pastor didn't do so swell, and maybe there's just some sin issues or some junk going on, this guy is one of those guys that will go in, he says the hard things, he gets pushes and asks the hard questions, and sometimes makes very few friends, but gets the church back on mission. And so he has, he has a, a difficult time in this, and he was telling me about one of these churches that he did this, and they had a congregational meeting like we do every year. And two men stood up and decided they were going to tell him just the kind of man he was. And so they started by questioning his methodology and all his methods, like outreach and evangelism. How dare he? And then they questioned his theology, including some things that are just alliance doctrine. And then the worst of it, he said, this went on for about 20 minutes. They started questioning his character. That if he was truly a man after God's heart, he would not even be you know, making these discussions happen. And he said the whole time that they're doing this, um, if, you, if you know the guy, he, he's a firecracker. And he was ready just to let him have it. He said, I was waiting for them to be done and I was just going to let it loose. And he was talking about this was a time that the Holy Spirit of God shut him up. So when they got done, he was ready to go, and what came out of his mouth was, I see you're really upset about these things. Would you agree to get together with me and talk about them and pray about them? Now, interesting enough, if he had come across yelling and screaming, it would have probably been ugly. But in that moment of asking them to join him in prayer, it was dead. Totally dropped the issue. Now, his testimony was that God was changing him. God was molding him inside. So we need to recognize, when we talk about this, this how we respond, this soft answer, turning away wrath, we need to recognize that this is the outflow of our hearts. Our speech is enrooted in our hearts and how they function. In Matthew 12, 33-37, Jesus spoke of this. Either make a tree good, and it's fruit good. Or make the tree bad, and it's fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. Talking to the religious leaders, you brought a vipers. How can you speak good when you are evil? 
For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Does it get any clearer than that? The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Out of the outflow of our hearts. And so, my challenge is this. I, I am, this sermon is for me. <laughs> this is probably one of my struggles. Um, some of you know some of our journey before we came here. When Mark talked about the people, you know, calling him out publicly and accusing him of everything in the world and attacking his character, I've been there. It hurts. And what wants to come out is anger. You want to lash out. But when we come to those points where what you want to do is just yell and tell them how it is, you need to step back and ask, what is your heart's attitude? Why are you inclined to speak that way? Why do you wish to speak that way? And the question I have to ask myself is whose interest am I looking out for? Am I looking out for God's? In my need to, I'm going to use Bob as an example, if Bob lambastes me and I want to say, Bob, now you can't be talking to me. Like, now who am I looking out for? Am I looking out for God? No. Not that Bob would ever do that. He's a sweet guy. Probably. And he's from Ohio, so that's even better. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, okay. He married into a, that's even better yet, Bob. I think there's a proverb about that. <laughs> Who are we looking out for, God or ourselves? In those moments of anger, are we looking out for God or ourselves? Are we more concerned about proving our own self-righteousness than we are the truth? One of the questions that gets asked a lot in interviews, uh, with uh, if you're looking for a pastor, I know Pastor Rivlin asked all of my references, He said, does Matt have a teachable spirit? And I think how we react speaks to that. Do you have a teachable spirit? See, someone who's willing to be corrected and admit being wrong is less likely to be angry, to get agitated. They're more likely to see the other person's point of view, more able to gain the trust of others. And guess what? If you're doing all that, you're more likely to have influence for the kingdom. This proverb is exactly the opposite of what Jesus was encountering with the religious leaders of the day. They were so concerned about maintaining their own self-righteousness, maintaining that they were right, that they were harsh, and they attacked Jesus constantly. But were they really looking out for God or themselves? They were so consumed with being right you, I don't know if you, you got this. They're so consumed with that, that I have to be right, that they miss God in the flesh. Let me ask you this. When someone has confronted you about something in your life, have you been so consumed about being right that you have missed the Lord speaking through someone to you? I fear I have. Wise people don't only not provoke the situation, they speak words that lead to peace. And so this is basically the concept. So we can't do this, right? Does anyone there think they, I can pull this off. I can always speak a nice, gentle word. If you think you can, we need to talk because you've got something I don't. This is basically fruit of the Spirit. Peace. You know the passage, Galatians 5. Chapter, verses 16 through 26 says this. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, 
jealousy, fits of rage, anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so when we talk about this issue of what comes out and how we react in conflict, it boils down to that daily dying to self that we talk about. I, I share with some of you, a, a lot of times I enjoy Sunday mornings especially, I like to go walk and be here early. I wasn't here as early as I normally am. But part of my time every morning is I have, I have to actually say it to the Lord. Lord, I'm putting me on the altar. Please crucify it again. And then take that dead corpse and rave it to life. Because we've heard it before. Our God is not a God who makes bad people good, right? He makes dead people alive. And so every day I crawl in that altar. And there are days when this stuff comes out, when I want to speak out of anger and frustration. And that's my flesh crawling right back off that altar. We crawl on. And when we do, then we say, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, kind, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against things there's Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. In any situation, our response from the overflow of our heart will either hurt or help the situation. In that overflow, it's either going to come from our flesh or it's going to come from the Lord Jesus Christ. And no offense to any of y'all, I love y'all, but I want to see Jesus, not you. This is true whether you are right in the conflict or you're wrong. In any circumstance, it can be held true. Let me prove that to you from Scripture. I know where I'm in a lot of Scripture today, it speaks better than I do. Romans 12, chapter 12, verses 14 through 21, tells us this. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Now, in persecution... Who's right? Is it the guy persecuting you for your faith? No. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to all you do, what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink, for by doing so you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not over, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Our reaction to conflict, persecution, any sort of conflict, whether it is ill-founded or true, needs to be one of gentleness. It needs to be Christ in us. We know our words have a profound effect on all that we do. A profound effect. James chapter 3 speaks to that profound effect said lots of word today. I, on a side note, I've had a few people have started asking me, like, what to expect when pastor finally retires. I can promise you that we will read the word of God a lot every week. Amen? Amen. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness, for we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is perfect. Now, I love y'all, like I said. I don't know if any of y'all perfect, though. So we've all struggled with this. 
There's not a person in the room that has not struggled at some point with their mouth. He is perfect man, able to bridle his whole body. If we put bits in the mouth of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, whatever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a fire is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird and reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives? Or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Do you hear James's word there? If I'm in a conflict over here with my brother Bob, and I'm lambasting him and putting him in his place, and then I turn over here to, to Velma, who's so sweet I could never be upset at her, and I'm speaking sweet kindness to her and telling her how sweet she is and what a wonderful gal. He's saying, James is saying, that cannot be. Salt water and fresh water cannot come from the same spring. It should not be. Someday, we read earlier, we have to give an account for our words. And when we stand before the king to give that account, what do you think will be our reaction? How were your words, your words, measure up against the holiness of God? I think our reaction will be similar to Isaiah's in chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. And with two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of Him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. What a beautiful picture of what we are going to stand before someday. In Isaiah's words, Woe is me. For I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So my question for you this morning, is your habit, is your norm to crucify your flesh and what comes out of your heart and your words is it Christ Jesus speaking through you so that you respond in gentleness? Or do you allow your flesh to rise up and do you speak rashly? Is your tongue a tree of life? Proverbs 15.4 A joy? Proverbs 15.23 Do the words that come out, are they good news? Proverbs 15.30 Do they bring peace? Or are you throwing gasoline on the fire? I'm going to ask Bev to come up and, and play here. Like I said, James makes it clear that every one of us has struggled with this. And so I, I want to give a few moments. If there's something that God has brought to your mind that you spoke rashly here, I'm going to ask you to spend some time praying. Confess that to the Lord. Give it to Him. If there's a specific person that you said that to, and they're here in our body, 
Let me encourage you, before you leave this building today, reconcile with your brother or sister. I'm going to give you a few minutes while the piano plays. Just wrestle through anything the Lord might be speaking to you, and then I'll close in prayer.